Um, Ken, yes, Ken is going to let you, come on, slide, keep going, keep going, come on. That thing is four-wheel drive, man, come on. Uh, Candy's got a, a follow-up to her visit to those folks at the hospital. Okay. Um, as everyone knows, we took donations last Sunday, and we raised $1,700. I can't think of anything better to do than to take a moment and pray for Tierra. That's her name, right? Tierra? Let's do that together. Father, we're uh, little people, but we're loved by you, and we believe your word, and your word tells us that because of what Jesus has done on the cross, that we have the ability, the privilege of coming before the creator of the universe and speaking to you. And so, as your sons and daughters, your loved ones, who are just want to ask your great blessing upon this little girl. As Candy has stated, we don't know what your plan is for her, but we know for sure that you are madly crazy in love with her. Lord, I thank you for letting us be a part of her life. I thank you for the privilege of praying for her. We pray that you would comfort her mom. I, I, I hope I never have to go through that. None of us want to. So her mom must be just freaking out. So we pray that you would comfort her. And Lord, if it be your will to completely heal that little girl, then we say let it be done for your glory. Not just to heal her because she's little and cute, but Lord, so that people would see how mighty and awesome you are. Let your healing hand be upon her so that you would be famous, that you would be adored, that you would be worshipped, Lord, through this. Thank you for that, Lord. And if there's anything else that our church can do as a family to show your love for this family, I pray that you'd let us know. Help us to respond well to that, Lord, because sometimes, as much as we like to get up and tell people to let go of their wallet for you, Lord, sometimes we don't want to let go of our wallet for someone else. And so I pray that you'd help us to respond well to their needs. Thank you for, for that little girl. Um, this, is, this is a baffling thing to me. Who in the world leaves a brand new chicken sandwich here? 
That's what I want to know. Yeah, right. Who leaves a chicken sandwich here? And no one wants to claim it? Oh, you all are crazy. I don't care. I'll eat that thing right now. Right here from last week. Um, okay, I only have really one announcement, and that is that this Monday night is our dinner. So if you could uh, make something, bring something, 6.30, and uh, I guess Big Paul's going to, I don't know, he should just do some stand-up, really, right? Yeah. But uh, he's going to have some games and fun, and I don't know exactly what he's going to do. So um, just like the movie <laughs> that I didn't know about, Paul's coming. So I don't know what he's going to do, too. So take me out of the equation, please, but show up with a lot of food. That'd be awesome. Um, I want to say this, that uh, uh, we're, this is not going to be short tonight. Remember Kyle said something about three hours last week? Someone was like, well, I'm not preaching for three hours. Okay? But it's not going to be short. So I just want to tell you something. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, seriously, I have a lot to share with you tonight. And I'm, so I'm going to get right to it. But if you need to leave, I'd rather you have to go and just go than to sit there and squirm and make... You know, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable to, like, to drive you crazy. I want to drive you crazy to action, but I don't want to drive you crazy and make you hate me or hate this church because we kept you here all night. So if you have to leave, it's okay. You can put your head down and duck out of here in shame, and we won't make fun of you much. <laughs> you can. But I'm just saying it's not going to be short. I have a lot to share with you today, so please bear with me. Um, we've been uh, – uh, someone made fun of me. Um, we've been going through the book of Jonah. Now, you know that this church, this is what we do. We go through books of the Bible, and we run up into, into areas in Scripture that, that are contrary to popular belief. Whether in the church or not, we, we hit those, those walls, and then we stop, we park there, and we dissect and find out exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Right? Well, um, if you've been in this church for a while, you know that's what we do. But every now and again, God like invades your space. Like Jessica said, he invaded her space and wrecked her world in a good way. He's invaded our space right now. And so uh, this week and, and probably next week, we're not going to be uh, in the book of Jonah. So if you've turned there thinking, ha, ha, I'm super holy, I got it. No, we're not going to Jonah. We're not going to Jonah. Okay, we're going to be all over the Bible. But although we don't do a whole lot of topical stuff, tonight is, a, is an issue that we need to cover. And um, no better time than the present. So as you probably saw on all the screens and stuff and on the door and all over our Facebook page and our website, you saw this little picture right here uh, over the last week. And, and you're probably wondering what in the world is going on. So that's what we want to do tonight. Um, this whole thing about what, what's next, I'm not talking about little stuff um, like, you know, do I order my steak medium or medium well? I, I, I've been out to the restaurant and people are like, you know, by the time you get 30, don't you have that figured out yet? I wonder why that always is a, an issue. Like, why? You don't know, really? It's like a big thing. Like, I don't know, honey, what do you think? Should I do medium? You know, I've got to figure it figured out. Or maybe it's just a guy thing, but like, I know I just want you to knock the horns off it and I want you to send it out. I want to see where the jockey was hitting, right? You know, that's the way I like a steak. So I like make that decision. So I'm not talking little decisions like that. Burger King, McDonald's, you know, even I know everyone's gonna think I'm crazy, but like Gators or Seminoles. That's a big deal, right? No, it's not. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. I'm talking about game-changing stuff. I'm talking about big stuff. I'm talking about defining moments in your life. You're like, should I marry this dude? Should I marry this girl? You know, the decision to have kids. Like these, I'm talking about big stuff. You know what I mean? And that's what we're kind of talking about tonight. And, and I'm not going to give you, a, I'm not going to tell you exactly what we're talking about right, right out of the gate. I want you to stick with me and hear it out, and we'll get to it. But I want to talk about what's next for our church. Uh, before I do that, I want to uh, encourage you that if there's a next step in your faith individually, like Andrew, like that was the next step in his faith, in his walk with Christ, was to go and get baptized. Like he had been hearing it, and he wanted all he could get from Jesus. Jesus wants to give you a lot. He wanted all that. He wasn't getting it. And, and, and it's that stuff right there, that, that stubborn disobedience that we all are guilty of that keep us from that amazing life with Christ. And so finally, after he's knocking on the door, knocking on the door, Andrew's like, fine, I'll let you in. So he does it. So I just want to encourage you, like, if there's something that you're, you're needing to do that he's been knocking on your door, do this, do this, do this for a long time, and you won't do it. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to go down the list. You know what it is already. You know what it is. And you keep saying no, you're stuck. Don't say no anymore. Okay, but this night, this we're talking about this, 
this uh, what's next for the church corporately together us SNL church now to, to, before you can talk about what's next I think that it's wise to have a clear understanding of of course where you've been you know where God started with you where he has taken you thus far so we want to talk about where we've been we want to talk about where we are and then of course what's the next question I, you guys are so stinking easy. Amen. I've been waiting for this all week. Wrong answer. No. That's close. You see, that's, that, I think, uh, check me if I'm wrong. I think that the answer that you gave, no one's self-intended, but I think that's extremely arrogant. Because I thought the same thing. And all of a sudden, it hit me. When you, when, God is so good. When I thought that same question, I was like, well, where are you going? That's the logical next time. All of a sudden, that, that, that brief little story, talk about this big, it's in the book of James. It's in the book of James. If you want to go there real quick, it's in the book of James, uh, chapter 4, verse 13. You go there. It's the incredible story. If you want to, you can go there. You can just make a note, read it later. It, it's, it tells of the, these guys that say, hey, you know what? We're going we're gonna to go to this city, and we're going we're gonna to live there. We're going to start a business. We'll make all kinds of money. And God's like, no, 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 no. You got, you got that. No. What it should be, if you're a Christian, is... If the Lord wills, we'll live there. And if the Lord wills, we'll make some money there. It's up to him. You see, when I see, when I think of where are we going, there's the problem. We, we, us. Where, what are we doing? See, it's our arrogance that says what we're supposed to do. And I think it's, I think our verbiage, although it's not a big point, but I think it's important to say that our next question should be where are we going. It's where do you need me to be? Did you ever see a coach on the sidelines? He's drawn up a play. They've got to play. So we're basketball, right? And, and you see the guard. He's dribbling down the court, and he's doing this, right? He's calling the play. But what you see, so that's a preset play. Like, everyone's supposed to get to their spot. But you see the coach, the crazy basketball coach. No, 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 down here. He's yelling at him, no, no, here. He's telling this one guy, this is the play, but I need you specifically in this situation in that spot. You know what I'm talking about? The crazy guys, their faces are so red they can't stand it. You know what I'm saying? The basketball coaches. He needs them in a certain place, and it's the same way in football. They're screaming like crazy. Here, 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 here. Because they need that guy in one specific spot. It's coach. Where do you need me to be? Any golfers here? No golfers. Nobody's played golf? Hey, okay, when you play, do you remember when you hit that shot? And it's one in a million, but you hit that shot, and the moment you've impacted that ball, you just know you've hit it right on the sweet spot. And that's when you start doing this. You're posing. You know what I mean? I'm Tiger. Look at me, right? All the other shots, you hit it and you're flinging your club because you're so ticked off. You hit it bad. You're busting it over your knee. But that one time, you hit or you're putting, and you get this 35-footer. And as soon as you hit it, you just know that sucker's going. You hit the sweet spot. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the sweet spot. God's sweet spot. That's what we're looking for. Okay? Now, let's talk about this. Let's go to where we've been. A lot of you, like I had, um, John was here, you know, big John, right? He was here last week, so last week or the week before. Uh, he's only been coming to this church, you know, like he started coming like a year ago, right? Right. And he, are, he was in here going, man, all those new people, who are they? Like he's new and he's saying, who are these new people? Like he didn't know half the people that were in here. And so I, I want to go down memory lane a little bit because some of you know where we've been, but a lot of you do not. A lot of you just heard about some church, it's local, a buddy told you about it, hey, the music's good, come check it out. So I want to take you down memory lane a little bit, so you know where we've been. You want, uh, before we decide what's next, we've got to remember where we were, see where God has led us all the way. So I want to bring you to uh, the beginning of 2010. In 2010, I was the associate pastor at a church in Mount Dora. The pastor there, great guy. He asked if I wanted to come and be his associate pastor. And after about a year, he was going to retire. So he said, why don't you come and hang out here, bring that little group of people that keep stubbornly following you, won't leave you alone, Mary and Joseph. And, 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 and why don't you come and hang out here, and you can kind of, uh, kind of like pastor under me. I'll teach you some stuff. And then when I retire, you can kind of take over as a pastor. So I prayed, and we went there, and 
decided to go. So we were there, and, and, and the people there were great. The people were great, right? Yeah. Sweet old folks, just, you know, they had the, the, the paneling on the walls, and they had the lady with the orange hair playing the organ. It was brutally awesome. <laughs> Is there such a thing? Right. So, so we're hanging out there, and, and so they loved us, but they didn't like our style. Like, they'd come in here, and they'd listen to you guys sing, and it's like, you know, that's not church. That's not church. So why don't you guys do this? Why don't you just do a separate service? So we'll do a contemporary and we'll do a traditional. A lot of churches do that, right? So we decided, okay, let's do that. We'll do it on Saturday night. So so starts Saturday Night Live because we were not singing with hymnals. We, were, we actually had a guitar and, and we would actually sing. It wasn't good. I sang. That's what we sang. And so we started this thing. Okay, long story short. Uh, the pastor retires. I'm supposed to move, slide right on in there, right? Well, that didn't happen because they brought in an interim. He was 75 years old. He thought we were a honky-tonk thing. What are you doing under the cover of darkness? What are you trying to hide? This isn't church. Get out. Certified letter. You're no longer needed here anymore. Take your stuff. Take your people. Get out. Y'all know we get thrown out of there, okay? So uh, it's so much, and here's my poor wife, right? We just started dating, and she's like, oh, great, I get this pastor, boyfriend, things are good. Next thing you know, the sheriff shows up at the church. This is like her third week at the church, and they're trying to escort us out of the building, but everyone cowered, and they already left because they didn't want to go to jail. But she stuck it out. She hung out in there, and she stayed, so I married her. I figured that was the right thing to do. <laughs> and so uh, we get thrown out. And so we moved over to the, uh, to the UMAC, which is the uh, secondary sanctuary of the United Methodist Church in the Berries. So my buddy Chris was the youth pastor at the time, and he said, well, just come. I, I didn't know what to do. There was, you know, 10, 12 of us, including kids, and I love these people. We all love each other. We love the Bible. We love God. didn't know what to do. We weren't a church, but we were a group. We were like a little family, you know, so I was like, well, what are we going to do? So I called up Chris. I was telling him, you know, what was me? He's like, well, just come. Bring your people, and you can use our little sanctuary there for a little while, and I'll talk to the pastor. Maybe they'll let you stay. So we, it was funny. We, that, that night... Uh, when people showed up for the Saturday night service, my buddy Randy, Joseph's brother, he's sitting outside at his van, and he's like, okay, nobody go in, uh, change of plans, no one do anything, change of plans, get in your car, follow me. So they caravan down Old 441 to the Methodist Church, and I had been there already for an hour or so, we set everything up, we're ready to go, and so we started, so we started worshiping there. And so we hung out there, and it was about that time that we put up that sign, the scumbags welcome thing. And we've discovered the fact that we we're actually a church. It's like we're a church now. We're not just a little Saturday night thing. Like we're a church. We're a group of people. We love each other. No intention of starting anything fresh. We're going to just be at that little church. Everything's going to be great. But it didn't work out that way. Now we're a church. So we go on. We put a billboard up. I want to get some people there. Put up a billboard. All of a sudden it's on CNN. It's on Fox. 250 million people see it. I'm like, yeah, we can't keep Saturday Night Live. We're going to get sued. I'm going to go to jail. I'm going to drop the name. So we just went with SNL, which really, honestly, it means nothing. Who has a name for SNL? Scumbags Need Love. Okay, that's a good name. What else? What is it? Sinners Need Love. What was this one? Shepherding new life, starting new life, salt and light. Come on, keep coming. That's our name, all of them. Yeah. Every single one of them is our name. I was thinking we might have to do another billboard. Listen, do, 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 do. you're all welcome. <laughs> yeah. Save not lost. So we put that thing out there. And so we started, we were like a church. So we hung out there for a while. Uh, and then someone called about this place. And I didn't want to move. Actually, we were looking at another place, a little strip plaza in Tavares. That kind of fell through. We had a deal, and then all of a sudden, the lease comes with the numbers, and I was getting ready to sign. All of a sudden, the realtor called me and says, the owner won't take it. I'm like, wait, but that's his lease. Yeah, but he decided he was going to double the rent. Apparently, he didn't want church in there. So we said, no, forget it. So now we're still in that same place, okay, for free, right? For free, two years. No reason to leave. Amen? Right? And, and so uh, this lady that that, uh, that was coming for a little bit, she called. She saw the little sign in the window for lease. So she said, just go talk to me. Okay, so I talked to the guy. So we're driving over there, and I said, Meredith, I'm tired of looking for another place. It fell through. I don't want to spend another minute thinking about it. But, you know, and I don't want to say no to God. So if, let me tell you this. If he does this, this, I've never met this guy. If he does this, 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 and this, then I'll know, and then we can do it. So we drive down here, meet this guy named Emil and Christine Farron. They own this joint. 
and he proceeds to do this, 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 and this. Okay. So I still wasn't enough. I'm stubborn. So I drive it home, and my wife's crying. How long are you going to say no to God? <laughs> that wasn't enough either, so I had to call my other wife, Kyle. <laughs> The other, the other, the other conscience who tells it, and he didn't, he wasn't like crying because he didn't start crying until last week, right? Um, but <laughs> he said it a little bit differently. He gave it a normal Kyle verbiage. How long are you gonna spit in God's face? Have you signed the lease yet? So that's what I got from Kyle. So we signed the lease. We start building this place, and here we are. So we've been here. Um, I wanna, I wanna lead you to a place. In Scripture, Philippians 1, if you go there. Philippians 1. This is uh, the words of Paul, the Apostle Paul, the greatest evangelist who's ever lived. Just spoke the words of God. He's, he wrote the majority of the New Testament. He, he says something that is extremely famous in Scripture. Um, and I want to read this to you because I think it's absolutely pertinent for us. I think it's important for us. Um, this is what he says. And I think that sometimes this is taken a little bit out of context, but let me just read it. Let me start in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, give you a little context as to uh, the famous quote. Uh, Paul says this. He says, he's talking to this church, okay? He's talking to a group of people in Philippi. It's a group. It's a church, okay? Not just a person, to a church. Every time I think of you, so that sounds personal, but it's not. It's to a group. When he thinks of that church, okay? He says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. See, it's, it's to the group. He says, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So, it's that famous verse. The one who began a good work in you will continue to do so until the day of Christ. Okay? That's a very famous, that's like a mountaintop scripture in the Bible. Now, but I want to point out something. It's not just uh, it, the normal references to you. Like the, the God who started in you will continue to work on you. Like, I, I agree. But this, if you look here, he says, the one who began a good work in all of you, as, as a body of believers, he started a work in this church. He planted it. He's growing it. He began that good work. He will continue to do that good work as a family of believers here in this community. But he does it in you personally. As he's building each one of you, we're being built as a whole, as a family. But you have to know it's for everybody. It's not just individual. It's for the whole church. And I believe that that is very, very true here in this church. I believe he's going to continue to do a work here in this church. Not necessarily this, like, not in this building, because he's doing it outside the building, too. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, this morning, I'm just going to tell you this. There's a lady who doesn't go to this church, but she is friends with someone who goes to this church. So that person from this church organized a bunch of people from this church to go to her house and happily pack her U-Haul truck because she was moving. She's a single lady, a little bit older, can't do it on her own. So these youth from this church went there to this lady's house that they do not know, and they helped her. They showed Jesus love. That stuff with the money for this lady, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't happen, when I say here, I mean here. Do you see what I'm saying? He's changing us, and as a result, he's changing the whole church. Now, this church, when it started, I pressed these, uh, what I'm going to tell you, like constantly. This was the foundation, like the pillars, if you will, of this church. I can't speak of any other church. But this church, knowing that he's working on us, but it was built on these three things. And I want to bring it up again because it has to kick into your mind one more time. You got, I got to bring you back here so you know exactly how this church functions how he's going to continue to do it. He does it this way. Uh, th it's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you could go there with me, please. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I've, I've, I've been through it, I've wore my pages out talking to you about it, but it's been probably over a year since I mentioned it. 
He will continue to work on this group. He will continue to work on you individually. But how he's going to work in this church is this way. You'll see that the same guy, Paul, is talking to his apprentice, Timothy. And he tells him in chapter 4, he, he says, I solemnly urge you, like in the presence of God, like God's right here. And, and I, I'm telling you, with him watching, this is what I need you to do. And he didn't say go start a program. He didn't say go knock on doors. He didn't say anything like that. He said, preach the word. That's what he wants you to do. If we're living stones being built into a spiritual temple, if we're the bricks, this is the, the word of God is the mortar between the bricks. This is the thing that holds us all together. This is the thing that he uses to build the church, is, is the word of God. He says, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke and encourage your people with good teaching. Now, I hope that what we do, Kyle and I, Kyle and I is good teach. We try our best. It's foolish preaching. But hopefully God is using it to build up this church. So that was the first pillar. That was the thing that we were going to do. We were just going to preach the word of God. Whether it was easy or not, we were just going to preach the word of God. Not a lot of topical stuff. Now, poor Kyle, he's topical. Because he only does it once every six weeks. So he can't go through a series like that. So he does a great job with what he does. And that will change over time. He'll do more you know, week-to-week -week stuff as time goes forward. I know in his ministry, I don't know where, where or when or how, but it's going to happen. But we, what we do is we preach through books of the Bible. That's what we do. We go, we start, let me see here. This is what we've done. We've gone, let me bring up these pictures. I, think, I, I want to jog your memory. Some of you might remember these pictures. They were like the, the graphic for our book studies. You remember we studied through the book of the Gospel of John. And we realized who Jesus is. That's where we started. It was way, way back at the Methodist Church. We preached through the book of John. We saw who Jesus is and what he's doing, what he did, what he's going to do. It gave us a clear picture of, of Jesus Christ the Lord. Before we went on to do anything else on any other subject, you got to know who Jesus is. So we did that. What was the next one? I don't remember the order. So This was a study through 1 Thessalonians called Witness Protection Program. This was a, a letter that Paul wrote to a church. That, that was a good church. They were a good church. And they were doing it right. But they kind of got a little sideways sometimes. Not bad. He, and he knew that trouble would come. And so he's trying to help them guide through life and make the right choice to be the best witness to the world. So we studied through that book. What was the next one? This was uh, for unlawful carnal knowledge. The story of, of this crazy church in Corinth. Now, if, Thessal if the church in Thessalonica was a good church, Okay, this was the polar opposite. This was a jacked up church. They did everything wrong. They're suing each other, getting hammered on communion. Uh, this dude's sleeping with his stepmom. It's disgusting. Okay, they're a total wreck. And so Paul writes this blistering letter to, to rebuke them and tell them to get right because the world's watching. So we studied through that book as well. Um, this is one of my favorites, the book of Colossians. Uh, the book of Colossians helped us to focus in on who Christ is uh, he is the author of all things. He, all things were created by him and for him. He's the visible image of the, of the invisible God. Everything was created by him. It's all about Jesus. So we, we, we took all these other peripheral issues, we focused in on the person and work of Christ. And we studied through that book. Uh, this is an, also another good one. Uh, a triple dog dairy. This is the study of the book of Philemon. Some of you are going, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. It's in there, right? It's one page. It's towards the end. It's also Paul, and it was the story of Onesimus and Philemon, the slave who runs away, and he gets reconciled to God. And so Paul's like, he's a Christian now. He's not just a slave. Now he's your brother in Christ. Forgive him. That was a tough one for everybody, to forgive those that are unforgivable and hurt him real bad. So we studied through that as well. Uh, not a very good graphic. I apologize for that. We studied through the book of Hebrews. Again, focusing on Jesus, he's the high priest, he's a prophet, he's the king. All these different titles of who Jesus is, the man of many hats. We studied through the book of Hebrews, it took us a long time, I loved it. This was the last uh, series that we did. Now this was not uh, a book of the Bible, this was the study of the life of Peter as he changes his before Jesus, during his interaction with Jesus here on earth, and then afterwards when the spirit of Jesus has entered his body to see how this man has transformed so we can see how hopefully we can be transformed. And then I guess the next one is, is where we're at now. I am Jonah. And so hopefully you've enjoyed that. We'll continue on in that book um, in the weeks to come, in months to come, really. Our process here, we're basically doing this. Yes. 
I got one more? Oh, yeah. Remember that night? Remember the night we talked about same-sex marriage? Yeah. We talked about homosexuality? Preaching the word. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's what we've done. And we'll continue to do that. Unashamed. Cover to cover. Before I die, I hope to get through every single book. We'll see what happens. The way I am, I probably won't. I'll stroke out before then, but we got time. It's cool. Um, so this is what we do. Our process is this. We proclaim the word of God. So we proclaim it, we explain it, and then we challenge you. That's what, we, that's what we're supposed to do. Proclaim what it says, explain what it says, and challenge you to live up to it. Okay, that's what we do. Now, um, if, you, if you look back into the uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, you, it reads on, this is to preach the word. And then the, the, the second and third pillars, they're there too. Uh, time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Verse 3. Uh, they will follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Okay. Now, here's where the second and third come up. It says here, uh, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news. Now, some translations will say, work, um, do the job of the evangelist. Some translations will say, do, a job, do the job of the evangelist. Um, a very famous evangelist, the only one in the Bible who I think is referred to as an evangelist, is Philip. Okay? If you go, go to the book of Acts, Philip, the evangelist, was one of the guys who the apostles appointed to be one of the guys who distribute the food. He was a guy who fed people. He wasn't necessarily the teacher. He was a, he was a worker. He did the feeding. He outreached, like he fed people, right? That's what he did. But as he went around and fed them, then it says that every town he went to, he preached the word of God. So he fed them, they knew he cared, and then he taught them, okay? And hopefully it changed a lot of lives. But that's what he did. Do the work of the evangelist. And see, that's the, the next pillar, to continue to reach out. So it's preach and reach, right? But then it goes on to tell us here in that same verse, it says, and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. So it's preach, reach, and the third one is never stop each. That's it. That's what our church is supposed to do. Now we could do a lot of other things, and we do, but ultimately that's what we're supposed to do. Preach and reach and never stop each. That's it. That's what we're supposed to do. We'll do that in the months and years to come. We'll continue to do that. I talked to you about the books of the Bible we went through. Honest preaching to the best of our ability. But I also want to remind you of the multiple times that we filled minivans with food. You guys have been gracious and kind. We call for food, you fill. I wasn't here a couple, but the last time you all did it. I, I saw the pictures, though. Just filled up this whole area of food. We did a food drive, it was filled up. I remember one time going <coughs> with um, a buddy of mine, Philip, some of you know him. We, uh, my car was just jacked full of food that you guys gave over at the Methodist Church. And we just brought it over to the food pantry and used just tons and tons of food. That box was filled up again the other day, just tons of food. Awesome stuff, okay? Um, to this point, you guys know, I want you to know, he doesn't do it for praise, but I want to just let you know about your church. Uh, Big John, Tattoo John, he still goes every week to that veteran's house in Eustace, and he shares the Bible and he prays with those guys. That's what he does. Okay, it's all part of your church. Um, I can't tell you, I cannot tell you, some of you would probably say don't do it, but I can't tell you the countless, just thousands of dollars that you guys have given to pay electric bills and rent. I mean, endless, endless money. We get phone calls constantly from people that are hurting, that need help, and you guys keep giving, and we keep giving. I mean, you've helped so many people. So we preach the word of God, but we also reach out, reach out, reach out. Do you guys remember the name Mr. Woodruff? The old man? The roof, the veteran, the widow. Supposed to help widows and orphans. We did. Put in a roof on his house. You know, the walls were all filled with mold and water. It was just pouring in on this old man. Now he's got a home. His wife died. His son died in the war. He's got nobody. His church wouldn't help him. We did. I'll remind you just by name so you can pray. The family that Candy was referring to, Tierra is the girl, Amber's the mom, Cheryl's the lady who's helping him. I mean, you <coughs> I mean, walk in with 1,700 bucks. You guys, no one in this church even knows these people. You don't even know them. 1,700 bucks. That's the grace of God. 
That's amazing. It doesn't happen. You look around you. Our church has grown. Look around you for a second. Look back. Just look back. It's like no big church, is it? It's not a very big church. There's, there's just many empty seats. There are full. 1,700 dollars. I don't know any person, one person in this place that has a single stinking dime. We're all broke. I hear it all the time. There's nobody in here money. $1,700. You walk to my door with $1,700, you might have to pull out the pallets. That would be crazy, right? That's crazy. It's a church over in Umatilla. So this is where we've been. This is what God's doing in our church. It's a church in Umatilla, life-changing church of God. Okay? Listen, I'm just going to say it. All black. Little neighborhood church, all black. Full gospel. No... No words in the screens, nothing, right? They don't even have hymnals. No hymnals. Denominational church. Young preacher. Awesome guy, James. On fire for the Lord, wants to breathe new life into that church, like wants to get it going. Denominational help. His sign is so bad, ours is horrible. You can't even read the letters. They've peeled off over the, from the sun so long, you can't even read the letters of the name of the church anymore. You walk in, and it's the same thing, the paneling, the pews. It's just rancid awful. But this guy wants to, to do something, get it going, right? His denomination won't even give him a buck. So you're their denomination. You're their denomination. So we stepped in, rounded up a projector, a cable, and a screen, and we installed it in their church. Board. And he sends me pictures on my phone. So excited, you know. Picture of him up there preaching. He's got the screen going with the projector. He's so excited, you know what I mean? He's so excited. So you're, you are their denomination. God uses you. This is an awesome church. It really is, and I'm very, very proud to be part of it. So that's kind of the story. This is, I don't know, 20 minutes in or so, 25 minutes. I haven't even started, really. <laughs> Sorry. And that's where we've been. Okay, so let's talk about where we are, okay, where we are. I just want to remind you, I, and I don't know if this is the stuff that you think about. Um, this place, this church, not just the building, but this church, is, it's a city here. I mean, honest to you, this is, the, this is the hand of God. This place is me. It really is. When we, when we started here, we had nothing. I can't even tell you how much money we had. Randy used to keep the offering in a, in a Maxwell House can in his sock drawer. There were weeks that we, you'd get two hundred dollars. We were so excited. We'd have, you know, we, there were times when the place would get up to 40, 50 people. We'd get an offering of two hundred bucks. I didn't want to do the math. I'm stupid. I don't even know multiplication tables, but that's horrible, right? We had nothing. So to move to this building, to move out of a building that was free, that was three times the size of this, to move into this, and have to pay twelve hundred dollars a month and then do all this stuff, you got to be out of your mind. All right, who would do such a thing? God's people would do it. Because God just takes care of all this stuff, and he did. Everything right down the line, it's crazy. Everything, and I've gone through the list before, but look at the TVs. You guys think you paid for them? No. How about the, what's that? The drywall. The guy who did the drywall. The guy who finished the drywall. The guy who did the flooring, the playground that your kids play on, the landscaping that's all pretty out there. Nothing. The roof, $6,000 worth of shingles from people that don't even, they might have even heard of this church. Why? God. I don't know. I have no explanation. He just makes it all happen. So we went from this little group of 10, 12 people to what you see here. It's funny. Um, I've been telling you in the last couple weeks of the stuff that's weighing heavily on me, and a lot of you have been like wondering what it is, what it is, I'll let you know tonight. Um, but if you've been in this church, you know that we started with nothing. And so to see this is just crazy. Like to see this is crazy, but I was asking God over the last couple weeks to like just give me some confirmation because we're kind of leaning towards doing something here, and I just need to know this is right. And the thing that I asked him for was the, 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 the attendance that was here, not this week or last, but the weeks prior, that, you know, it was packed in here, if you remember. It was like, do it again, Lord. 
So last week was the worst Saturday of attendance we've had in six months. Of course. And this isn't a whole lot better. Although I love you all, it's like, okay, real fun. Real fun. No confirmation in that. But I will say this, there are times when our Saturday night is full. And so we launched a Sunday service, which is awesome. Now, Sunday is anemic at best. Okay? At best. Right? We had, uh, two weeks ago, this, there was hardly a seat in here on Saturday night, Sunday morning, which, this is a crazy church. Sunday morning is the church day, right? It's when everybody goes to church. So on Saturday night, you can hardly get a seat. And on Sunday morning, we had six people. Now go figure that one out, right? Saturday night's supposed to be an afterthought. Like, how do we maybe reach some more people? Maybe let's do a Saturday night, because Sunday's so full. Totally opposite around here. Right? But then, of course, next week, last week, Saturday night's like half empty, and then Sunday was actually pretty decent for Sunday. So we like totally quit trying to figure out what's going on. We're just a wacky, wacky church. Uh, so the winter time is when it's packed in churches, and summertime it just goes down to nothing. We're completely opposite here. I have no idea what's going on. So it's just a wacky church. That's just the way it is. But, but it's a good church. Um, we've got tons of kids. Tons of kids. So many kids. Bless you. We have tons of kids in this church. You know, one of the reasons why we went over to that, that church in Mount Dora was that it was all old folks. And they, they want, for the pastor there, George, awesome guy, he said for nine years, nine years they had a prayer breakfast. And every week for nine years, they prayed that God would send kids to this church because we know it's dying and we need kids. No kids, no kids, until finally we got there. And the attendance was like 35, 40. We got it up to over 100. We did the first vacation Bible school in 25 years at that church. It was awesome. Then they kicked us out. Of course, why, why wouldn't they, right? It's crazy. But the kids that we have in this church, there are churches that would, die for this. That they would kill for this. To have all these kids. To say we have more kids than can fit. Poor Miss Paula, she's back there. She said, she told Mary, she said, tell Moses, don't get used to that little trailer back there, because we're going to take it over. We need room for our kids. Okay, there was eight little kids in that little room back there yeah. two weeks ago. And we have five pregnancies in the church. That poor lady! Right? What's she going to do? It's a great, I hate to even call it a problem. I started corrected myself this week, too. I think the Lord did. It's not a problem. It's an issue we have to deal with. But how awesome is that? How awesome is to, to be overrun with kids in a church? It doesn't happen too often. How about the awesome group of ladies that teaches that teach these kids all the time? I'm going to give you their names just so you can acknowledge them. Of course, Mimi, Amanda. Jessica, Alicia, Ms. Paula, Katie Johnson, Katie Allen, Siandra, and Mary. Week after week, they serve you, serve your children that they might know Jesus. Come on up. Come on up. Come on, Ms. Paula, don't you dare. Come on. Near me. Come on up here. No, come on up here. Come on up here. Come on up here. Come on up here. Come here. Come right here. Come on. We got some kids upstairs too, right? They're coming. So while they're here, if you're if you're a teacher on that list, would you stand up? If you're a teacher on that list, would you stand up? Come on. Kids are coming down. I want to. Um, I want to mention this. We have a an awesome youth group that meets here every Friday. Um, Austin, you all know Austin. You need to keep him in your prayers. He's been in the hospital the last two days. He's got gastritis. He's in a lot of pain. He told me he felt like he swallowed a porcupine. So please pray for him. Uh, but Amanda, Austin, and Eric Anthony, they lead our, our youth group every Friday night. Rock song. Come here, kids. Come here. 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 No. <laughs> okay, who wants to stone him? Go! No, I'm just kidding. This is, look, this is, this is our issue right here. This is our issue. This is, what, this is what I'm talking about tonight. This is the reason that we're here talking about what we're going to talk about tonight. Because of all these awesome kids. Now look, 
you can figure out, you can try to figure out what God wants you to do, or you can figure out what God's doing and jump on board. Okay? This is what God's doing. He brought all these kids. There's a lot of them that aren't here right now. Okay? Um, where's Jared? I don't even see him. Well, he's back there somewhere. Okay? He's got two. Sandra's got three. Um, who I don't even know who else is um, who else is missing? Yeah, Paul and Hope, they have two. I mean, there's just a ton of kids in this church, okay? There's a ton of kids in this church. This is what, this is, the, this is our issue, okay? Adriana, yes. Skylar, yes, can't forget him. Okay? There's no room for them. Yes, they have three. Who else? Marcus. Yeah. Tiana, Nick. Lily. Lily. <laughs> Who? Marcus. Marcus, yeah. Um, Marley, yeah. Slade, Slade yes. Five more coming. We gotta get a, start with fun for Prozac for Miss Paula. <laughs> okay, all right, kids, go, 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 go. Go on back, go back. Thank you. Thank you. soundproof booth, okay, and all the all the softwares on the computer and all that kind of stuff to, to start recording music, okay, so so that's another thing, he's, do you ever notice that we have this ever-changing group up here too, there's all these musicians that keep coming through, God just keeps sending them here, I don't know why other than that we're supposed to just reach out to the world with music, you know, they started a group retreat doing their hip hop thing. They're amazing. You know, last week they had five thousand views on YouTube. Did you guys know that? This is five thousand views. I don't know what God's gonna do with them, but you better get ready. Okay? It's all they turn out. They put on like this awesome song, a new song every week. Like who does this, right? It's crazy. But, but God wants to use this, this, this recording studio to create music, to worship, and to send out the message of the gospel to the world. Also, an opportunity to reach people that would never step foot in the church, right? You open up a sound studio for those folks that are doing rock and roll or country or whatever, and you get to come in here, and they got and, and in our sound booth we got Kyle and Jerry kind of running the joint. They're going to hear the gospel. You see what I'm saying? So it's an opportunity. God has given us this opportunity to reach the world through that, we've had, not to brag, because a lot of people that have gotten baptized here just kind of fell away, and I, and I know that breaks my heart. If you're, if you're a minister of the gospel, that just probably kills you more than anything. But we've had over 70 baptisms at, at SNL Church. Tons of babies on the way. He's just blessing this church incredibly. Every corner we've turned, he's taking care of it, because we really don't have anything. But I have to commend you, dude, and this is not, a, this is not for you to say, well, you don't have to give anymore, but you're giving and that's a sign of health. Because it's not that we need the money so much as that God wants your heart that you are willing, a small group like this, who none of us make any money, but you're willing to give of your resources and trusting in God. That's the whole purpose of this, is that you will trust and love God more. And it just shows in your giving. It's, it's really awesome. I've struggled with this, and, I, and if I'm wrong, please forgive me, but our, our giving, and it, I'm telling you this, because I know some people go, I don't think you're anymore. <laughs> okay, that's all I'm saying. Okay? Every week, this relatively small church gives like $1,200, dollars $1,300. It's really good. Who in here is rich? Any rich people? No one is. <coughs> At best, you own a little company or have a decent little job and make a decent living. At best, no one has any money. Every week, we take care of stuff so we can do crazy things like paying people's rent. We paid rent for a lady that Mary knows. 
How many other people in this room know that two weeks ago we paid their rent? Single mom, three, I think three kids. Sick, lady issues, surgery after surgery after surgery. Can't get back to work. Her rent's due, she's gonna get evicted, so you paid for it. No one in here knows those people. God's doing a work in these, in you guys, and me and all of us in this church, corporately. I'm gonna take you here now. We have massive county issues here, and I've told you about them at length. And it just got the county. It's gotten way worse. As a lot of you know, when we first got here, I went down to get an occupancy license so we could at least do something in here, start working, maybe have some Bible studies, whatever, just have anybody. So I went down to the county and I gave them my name, the address, and we're a church, we're going to have a little coffee shop, you know, I was full disclosure. So they said, well, it's going to be $100 to $300 in fees to switch use to the property. No problem. So I had my SNL card, you know, the, the, the debit card, I was going to pay it. So he's like, well, why don't you just wait, because I don't know the exact fee, it'd be 100 to 300 but I, we, have, we don't want to have to refund, you have difficulty refunding, so let me check with the supervisor and find out the exact amount, and then we'll call you and you can go ahead and pay it. Less confusion that way. Well, hey, that's cool, right? Okay, so four months goes by, and no call, no email, no nothing. I'm like, praise God. Awesome. Freebie. The favor of God is upon us. <laughs> until the building inspector came in and put a shutdown notice on the building. So, so starts the battle with the stuff that they now are telling us we have to do after we put thousands of dollars into the renovation of this building. I sat down with him and I said, I sat there with the director of planning and development, the lady in charge of the life safety inspections, which is fire code and stuff. And they pulled out the old site plans and they saw the square footage in the building and see they thought that <clears throat> because of the front fascia of the building kind of looks like different units, you know what I mean? Well, they thought we just used this. So based on this square footage, they said, you need a 3,000 gallon water tank. This is a fire. Not to bore you, but that was gonna be about 8,000 bucks. Okay, but then I said, well, listen, <coughs> we have a room back there, the nursery. We use that too. And did you know about the apartment upstairs? I'll lean back in the chairs. <laughs> Apparently, 20 years ago, so when they built that room, no one ever got a permit, so they didn't know. Well, that's included in the square footage, too. So based on some estimates, they said, oh, you're going to need a 5,000-gallon tank. So we were like, oh, boy, if, an eight, if a, if a 3,000 tank is going to be 8 grand, then what's a 5,000? 10, 12? So we got a company. I remember I told you about the tank, Vulcan over there in, in Astatula, they donated a 6,000 gallon tank. It's like, woo! And we we're all woo, right? I was woo. I was. Yeah. You drive by that field right now, they've moved it to the middle of the field, they pressure washed it, it's like, a, it's like as bright as that spotlight, clean and ready for delivery, except we can't use it. Because before we went and brought it here, you gotta have a licensed contractor who does tanks to pull the permit to put it on the property, so hire someone. Well, who do I hire? So they gave me a list of people that do water tanks in the county. I called one, great guy, utility technicians in Umatilla, Scott Purvis, I think his name is. He came out here and he, and he said this, here's the regulations from the county. Before I give them a site plan a, amendment and, and some drawings and get a permit, I gotta have this information so I know. You might not need a 6,000 gallon tank. Let's measure the place. Because you gotta measure the square footage, you gotta measure the structure, uh, you know, like what it's made out of, and how close it is, proximity to other buildings, and proximity to the road, and all that. And it has to be in a certain place in the property. It has to have a certain slab that you pour it on, engineered with metal spikes in it so you can tie it down. You have to pipe it into the well, all that. We need a 10,000 gallon tank. <laughs> That's what we need now. He said he'll donate one, before you get excited. He'll donate one. But to make it fit county specs, it's going to be five to eight thousand dollars with permitting, installation, slab, and all that stuff. Great. The owner of this place, awesome man. I called him. I told him. He said, "I'll give you five grand." Awesome, right? Well, it might be eight. So we got to come up with three. But it didn't stop there. See, I got the email and I passed it on to Dan and Kyle. 
in the email, we also found out that because of our square footage, because this is a multi-purpose room, that youth takes the they take the chairs down, they run around crazy and hang from the rafters, and have a good time. We have music nights and stuff like that. We have a great time. We have dinners. We move the chairs. See, when you don't have pews <laughs> that are bolted down to the ground that take up space, you have to measure every inch, every square foot of the church, including the stage, the storage closet, the bathrooms, the nursery, the upstairs, everything. And you have to figure out the occupancy load, how many people you can put in the church. If you took the chairs out and had standing room only concert, how many people can you fit in here? Because if you're over 2,100 square feet of open and available space in a gathering like we are, you have to have sprinklers. So now we have to do that too. Isn't that awesome? And along with the sprinkler system that ties into the tank, you also have to have a fully automated fire alarm system. And then they, if that wasn't enough, they said, oh, by the way, if you're using upstairs for kids, you need to build a fire escape. So now we've got to put a hole in the wall, build a doorway, pull a permit, engineered, drawings, but. <coughs> Forty, fifty thousand dollars on a building that's not ours. You know where I'm going, don't you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. It's not our building. It'd be kind of dumb. It'd be kind of dumb to do that, right? But here's the thing also. Our lease is done. So there's nothing holding us here. We're just here. Okay? But that takes us to the third thing, and that is, God, where do you need us to be? Coach, where do you need me? You know what I'm saying? Where do you need me? What's next? What's next? I'm just getting warmed up. I really, truly am. What? Sorry. Where do we need to be to fit into his strategy, to his game plan? Where, where do we need to be to be in the sweet spot of God's blessing? Where, where do we need to be to be in the best position for him to build his church? Not only to build his church in size to get more people to come to Christ, but where do we need to be where he can continue to do his best work in each one of us? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, I want to share this scripture with you. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, in that church that's completely jacked up, doing all kinds of stuff wrong, God's talking to these people, and the one thing he says first, the first thing he says is here in chapter 1, verse 10. He says this, this is the, the first concern I have when I talk about the issues that we have here in this church. He says this, he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is really, this is God talking to them. He has given this guy the permission to say this. To live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united and in thought and purpose. Now, there can be all kinds of individual passions within the church, but there can't be any con individual conquests or agendas. Like, i got to have it my way. And so the reason why I say that, it, oh, let me just go back here a little bit. He says harmony. That means all of us are different. We can have individual passions. Mary wants to feed people. I want to preach the word of God to people. There's other people that want to play music for God. I mean, we all have different passions, right? But the one thing is we need to all come together united in mind and purpose. Like, you can play music. Music could be the biggest thing to Grayson or Kyle, but it can't be the biggest thing. Preaching the word can't be the biggest thing. Not, feeding people can't be the biggest thing. The biggest thing is we need to know that our only purpose here is to glorify God by having more people worship, serve, and love Him. And we can do it all in different ways. That's why it talks about being harmonious. All different voices coming together to make a beautiful sound. And so I share this with you because my fear is that some people would grip this building. They would grip the building. They put a lot of money into this building. They put a lot of time into this building. They sat here week after week after week, pounding nails, finishing side of drywall, or whatever you did, building sound booths. 
that you would grip the building and not the work. And I'm not talking about the work of the bang and the nails. I'm talking about the work that God is doing in the people. God has changed so many people in this church, including me. I couldn't find happiness in church since I left the church that I got saved in 10 years ago until this. Kyle preached about love. Y'all know John. You heard Jessica. There's a lot of people whose lives have changed. My wife, raised in church. Life just destroyed by God in a great way. Nine people on that night. There were people that came to this church every week baptized to start afresh with their relationship with God. We've spent, the reason why I fear this is because we've spent, I don't know, we talked about the other day, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars of our money and the owner's money and donations on this building. We've spent a ton of money on this building to make it awesome. I walk in there, who loves this place? It's awesome, right? It's the most comfortable place you can ever be in. It doesn't feel like church. It feels like church should be. You know what I mean? My brother Harry right there putting in the spot. Not the youngest guy in here. And he said he would have a hard time letting go of this place because it's the first place he's ever felt at home. It's awesome, right? But let me ask you a question. Like Jessica said on the video, Whose relationship with Jesus and his family really started at this church? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, honestly. What's that worth? What's that worth? What people got baptized at SNL Church? Not just at this building, but with this church. What's that worth? What's that worth? How many people started exercising their gift? Singing, leading worship, teaching children, whatever it is. Who started it at this church? What's that? Here's the tough one. Who started, once and for all, tithing or giving? When you realized you didn't have enough money to give, but you trusted God, you started giving, and he still paid your bills. And you're still alive and you're still eating. Who started doing that here at this church? What's that worth? It's not about this building. It's about what God, when he's building his church, it's not about this building. It's about you. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, you can jot it down. It says this, you are coming to Christ. Everyone who raised your hand, you're still in the process of coming to Christ. You, you're, you're in his family, but you're still moving closer and closer and closer to him. As you break down, you let him break down these walls in your life, and you start to live for him. You start to serve him. You start to love each other. You start to give, and you allow him to bless you and take care of you. You're still coming to Christ. You who are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone. Amen. He's alive. That was a free you. Amen. Yeah. He is, the, he is the living cornerstone of God's temple. And you are the living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. See, it's not the building. It's you. You're the building. You're the building. Right? It doesn't matter where we meet. If we meet in a tent, you're the building. If we meet in homes, you're the building. If we build a massive gargantuan, you're still the building. That stuff's going to fall away someday. You're not. You're eternal. You're forever. You're the building. Okay? It's God who's doing it. And so as we, we refer back to that Philippians version, uh, verse that says that the one who began a good work in you will continue to do so. What that looks like is that people's minds, he's working on us to change our minds with the gospel. It's the gospel. I'm not worthy. He loves me. I'm going to live for him because of him. That's it. I'm going to serve him because of him. That's why I was created, to serve him and to love him. And so the more we change our mind like that, the more we can become united in mind and purpose. What it looks like is this, Ephesians 4.16. 
God takes us, who he's working on, he's breaking down those walls, we're coming to him in an increasing measure, and he takes us, and it says that he fits, Ephesians 4, 16, he fits us all together perfectly, helping each other to grow. So the body is three things, healthy, growing, and full of love. Do you guys look at, this is the Bible, and what is this church? Healthy, growing, and full of love. We're a healthy church of Jesus Christ. We should be happy about that. And he's fitting us all together so that your gifts and my gifts and your talents and my talents, they all fit together with our voids and gaps and they come together to help each other grow so that the church is healthy and growing and full of love. So what I want to do, and this is a little bit weird, you might think it's weird, but I want to stop for a moment, I want to pray. But I want you to do something that's really, really weird, okay? Nobody else, look, the only people that we don't know just left, <laughs> okay? We love them, but now we're family here right now. Hopefully they're part of the family soon. I hope they come back. I really do. I didn't get a chance application. to meet them. What's that? They a lot of Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A card, a card, a card. Listen, I hope to meet him. I think that that was John's buddy. Okay, you told me about a guy who's coming. Is it? Yeah, but awesome. And she's deaf, so she, they were asking if anybody could sign and help her interpret. Sundays. You tell her to come. I think Amy does, doesn't she? Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll call her and let her know. All right. Okay. Um, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to do something weird. Okay? I need you, everybody to hold hands. Hold hands. Find someone and hold hands. I want to pray. We're going to do this three times tonight. Look, we're not in a hurry. We're going to be here for a while. We're going to be here for a while. Huh? What's that, holding hands? We're a family. we got to connect somehow. Okay. I'm nice and clean. I'm dying. Sweat is bad. Okay. This is what I, want. I want you to close your eyes. And I want to pray with you. Um, here's the first thing. No divisions in the church. As we move forward and we try to decide what's next, Lord, I pray that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to be united in mind and purpose. Lord, help us to have a gospel priority. Help us to realize that the most important aspect of our life you, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, the perfect one who comes to save, who loves our souls. That is the most important facet of our life. It's the most important thing. And help us to live by the gospel. Lord, not only to recognize that your gospel is the most important thing, but help us to, to realize that no matter what our passions are, no matter what our bents are, Lord, our ultimate goal as a community of believers is to glorify you, is to share the good news with this community, whether it be by word or deed. Let that be our priority. Lord, we love you and we pray that no one would grip hold of this building as the church. Lord, you are the living cornerstone and we are the stones that you are building into your church. Help us to realize that as such. Don't let anybody Please, don't let anybody see the building as the church, the people as the church. We pray in Jesus' name. All right, you can go back to sleep. Or you can say that because we're doing it again. What's the next thing? I was just Here's the next thing that can happen. Pride can kick in. Pride can kick in. Even in a church of this size, pride can kick in. Remember James 4, we said earlier? No, we'll just go to this town. We'll live there. We'll make some money. So what can happen here? Look what we did. Look how awesome this is. Look at our church. Look what we built. Let's just get a bigger one. We'll fill it up. No problem. We got a great band. It's cool. We got cool down. They'll come. That can happen. It can happen. Big time. See, also in that same book of James, it says over in the same chapter, in, in verse 7, it says, humble yourself before God. We built nothing. I didn't build anything. I didn't build anything. 
The building didn't build it. Nobody did. You know who built it? The ability that God gave him. The only reason I can stand up here is because he gives me the ability to do it. That's it. That's all I need. The building didn't build anything. Nobody built anything. Remember in 1 Peter? It said that God is building us into his spiritual temple. Okay, similar verbiage through scripture. Matthew 16, 18. I, Jesus Christ, will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Ephesians 2.10 totally reverses the, the thought that most people have about us, us, what we do. He says, God has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. See, a lot of us will think that we'll do some awesome things and then God will be glorified because of it. Now that may be true, but think about this for a second. Just put that thought in light of this verse that says, God has created us so we can do those things. That's the proper perspective. It's just the same as James 4. We think we're going to do this, and God's like, no, if I allow you and give you the ability to do it, you will. And God has created us new. We are born again, and we have this passion for God. He did that for you so we could do good things to bring him glory. Uh, Paul talks to the folks over in Galatia. Let me, let me Do me a favor. Go to Galatians chapter 3. The same thing is happening in the Bible here. Okay, Galatians chapter 3, they get saved, right? They get saved, and we're like that too. We got saved, we started the church, but we can fall into this pride thing that we think that we're the coolest church in town, and everybody will want to come here because we were on the news, and because we have a cool building, and we have a great setup, and we got a recording studio, stuff that, that churches don't have. Even we can get cocky and say, look at all the kids we got. So we got to stay humble before God. God is doing this. Okay, God is doing this. And the same thing happened to the people there in this <coughs> book of Galatians. Paul says this. He says, uh, oh foolish Galatians. He can say that to us too. We have to be careful against this. He says, who has cast an evil spell on you? Right at the beginning of the chapter. For the, for the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as, as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You receive the Spirit because you believe the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? And see, that's what could happen to our church. We, we can start out by going, God did this. Awesome. We gotta, we, he did all these things so we can have this awesome church. But then we can kick in and think, now we can do this. We can go get a bigger building, and we will work hard, and we'll make it cool, and we'll paint it the right colors, and have the right chairs, and they'll come because we're a cool church. Look what we can do. And he's like, you foolish SNLers, why would you start by acknowledging me and then start to use your own effort to continue to build the church? He is the one who will build this church no matter where we go. It's God's work. It's God's work. So let's join hands again. We need to pray because pride kicks in. Pride kicks in, okay? Pride kicks in. You want to reach over there, Philip, and grab candy? Her hand. Thank you. <laughs> we are a cool church. Not that cool. Right, Jared? Amen. Amen. All right? We're not connected. We're not connected. Let's pray. Father, I pray that pride would not creep into this church in any way, shape, or form. I don't know how it would rear its ugly head, but it is our human nature to fall victim to it. So Lord, even though we're doing things that seem religious, seem good, that are within the confines of a church building and under the name of a ministry, oh, we're 501c3, we must be doing right. Pride can certainly kick in. So I pray, Lord, that you give us humility us to be humble before you. Help us to acknowledge, Lord, that this is your church. You started it, you have built it thus far, and you will continue to build it the way you see fit. Help us to realize that we are here only for your glory and your fame. Therefore, we must function as you see fit. Big buildings 
that serve big egos have no place here. If we have a big building, it's because you built it. If we have a small building, it's because you built it. If we do it in homes, it's because you built it. Help us to realize that the model that the American church gives us is not necessarily the only way to worship you. It is one way. There are a variety of ways, and help us to find your way and be in your sweet spot. Guide us to where we need to be so we can best do the good things that you have planned for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, here's the next one. Myself, and Kyle, and Dan, by your elf, for your slaves. What do we do for you? That's before we said, when we said yes to this, it's because we decided we'd bleed for you. That's just the way it goes. It's okay. So God put spiritual leadership in your church and at any church. He's done that. Now this is what the Bible says about our leadership. Because ultimately, even though we're a church that's small enough where I can share all that I will share with you tonight, ultimately, you've entrusted us to hear from God and make decisions for the church. And we will make decisions together, but ultimately, leadership will decide. I mean, we appreciate your input on all these things. But this is what the Bible says about leadership. 1 Peter 5.2 Our job is to care for the flock that God has entrusted to us. Now to further explain this, Hebrews 13.17 says that our work in caring for the flock is to watch over your souls. This is the stinger. And they are accountable to God. So that's a big, that's a heavy weight. See, everybody in here, no one in here is responsible or accountable to God for me. You're accountable to your own actions, but did you know if your heart's beating in here right now that Dan must give an account for you? And so does Kyle, and so do I. We have to make sure that we do our very best to follow the Word of God, to be sensitive to the Spirit of God, and to, lie, uh, to, 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 to lead you and guide you the way God would want. Like, and we have to answer to that. Someday when we look into his eyes. That's an incredible way. So this is where we need your prayers. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 16. I'll give you a scripture and I'll explain. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father. Okay, whatever is good and perfect. So, we want what God gives us. Like, we could go out and find a good deal on a piece of land or on a building. Like, we could go hunt it down, hire a realtor, and hunt down a good deal and go to get a good rate at the bank or a really good lease. And we could negotiate those things, and that's good. If you're in a business and you're going to buy a car or a house, that's a good deal. We should do those things. But in this case right here, I'm not quite sure that even a good rate and a good price is, is, is necessarily God's best. I'm not even quite sure if we found a place and worked a really good deal that he's actually even specifically involved in that, although he's sovereign, he's in control of all things, and he sees all things, but it, did, he, did he work out your interest rate for you? Like, maybe, but that's not always the best. We want the best. We want to hit God's sweet spot. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's where I need you to pray for us, that we would be sensitive to that, and we would be led by his spirit, and we would find that place for us. I remember when Jesus told his disciples in the feeding of the four and five thousand, you know, no, you feed them. You see, what he wanted to do is he wanted to, he wanted to take scraps, which is what we could get negotiating, and he wanted to turn it into Thanksgiving dinner. He wanted to take our scraps and turn it into fillets. Do you see what I'm saying? That he wants our best. He wants the best for his church. Okay, that's what he wants. Uh, psalm 23, again, you guys remember Psalm 23? It's the, it's the psalm that everyone quotes at a funeral. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, and I, I shall not fear. That's all good stuff. It's comforting, great. 
But the part I want to bring up to you is right towards the end of it, he says this. He says, uh, you're, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. That's what he wants for his church. To prepare a feast for you. To be the, the best possible situation for his church. So he can continue to grow you individually and as a group, as a family. That's what he wants for us. So I want you to pray. And this is weird. I want you, I'm going to say pray for me, but join hands again, please. This is a short one, but I want, to, I want you to pray. You're praying. You can say something. I don't know. <coughs> um, Father, um, we know that you love us. We acknowledge that you have brought us from the community chapel in Mount Dora all the way, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. You've taken care of every need that this church has needed to live and survive and thrive. And I thank you. We all acknowledge you in that. It's kind of weird, Lord, for me to say this, but I do ask that um, for myself and for Kyle and for Dan, Lord, that you would you would speak clearly to us, that you would help us to discern the spirits and find out what you want for, for this church. Lord, you said that we'll be accountable to you for this group of people, and that's a heavy weight, Lord. So help us, Lord, to, to guide this church into the loving arms of the great shepherd. Lord, I, I know that your word tells us that if we lack wisdom, that we would ask you and you would give it to us because you're generous. So I pray, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom in these things as we seek your will for this church. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to hear your voice so we know where you want us to. Last but not least, talk about this green, this green pasture. You know, he wants to lead us to the green pasture so we can have his best work in this church. And it's not just geography. It's not just the building or the land. It's the atmosphere. It's the conditions and the environment within the church family. I can tell you that there is a growing desire in this church for the authentic. Like, I think that everyone in here would say, even if you don't love big churches, that it would be awesome to see great numbers in our community that are absolutely not Christians, that they would all of a sudden start coming into this church in great numbers and people would be just giving their life to Christ and we're like, dunking people like crazy and they're all, you know what I'm saying, like, and there'd just be thousands, this wave of, of, of renewal in the community and everyone's getting saved and all of a sudden you're like, it's not like we want to build, we have to, we have like, like thousands of people coming, it'd be great, right, it'd be awesome, 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 but that's not necessarily what's happening in churches, but you see it on TV and you're kind of like, well, that's the way it should be and I don't know what's going on in a big church, I have no idea, I have no idea, I really don't. I know this, from hanging around with you guys, you want the authentic. You want to be in a church where people just love God with all their mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love each other, and just reach out to the world with the love that Jesus has put in your heart, to help them, even if they don't come to Christ, just to love on them, because that's who we are. That's what you want. And I gotta tell you something, on Sunday nights, this is like erupting. Okay, we're coming up with stuff all the time on how we can have the authentic here in this church. Okay? I would invite you to come on Sunday evenings. But the best picture, i got to tell you this, the best picture in all of Scripture of the authentic, the greenest pasture in all of Scripture, and so it's not what you see on TV. Let's go back to the truth of God's Word, right? The truth of God's Word, the best picture is, is right there in the book of Acts. You see it when all the people were devoted to the scriptures, they were devoted to prayer, they were devoted to sharing everything that they had, $1,700. They, they were devoted to this, to share everything so nobody had any needs. 
They felt like none of their stuff was their own, and they just shared it all so nobody was in need. Like, they didn't care about, about anything else other than this guy just rose from the dead, and he told us to go and do this thing, so let's just do this thing and leave the rest up to him. That, and there's a growing sense of that in this church that we just want to see the authentic. We want God to be here with us and do exactly what he says to do. And just love him like crazy and love people and love each other. And that's what this church is all about. That's the way it's supposed to be. And so you see in the book of Acts, they shared, they prayed, they praised, they served, they were learning together, they were growing together. And what happened? No outreach. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But there was no outreach there. But what happened? Why? Because God grew his church. It says it right at the end of the paragraph. And every day, you see that thing that happened with Andrew, you guys all clapped? Every single day that was going on. I mean, imagine that. Imagine that every single day people were coming in here, dunk, dunk, like when my arm was getting tired. Every single day. It said that there were thousands coming. Isn't it the same God? Does everybody in this country know Jesus? They're all saved? There's Andrew, a typical all-American kid. He's even got blonde hair, blue eyes. How old are you? 19. 19 years. No salvation. Boom, why? There's tons of those out there. we got to get them. Right here, right? We just need to see this happen like crazy. We need to see this happen like crazy. I'm all in on that. I'm all in on that. But the fellowship increased. Not because there were purposely having programs to reach people, it's because they responded to this gospel that rocked their world and they just lived for it and when they lived for it, what did God do? I want people there. I want people there. Preach the word of God, reach out to people like crazy and never stop each one. And he'll do that. He will do that. So where is this pastor? And what does it look like? And how will it function? I don't know. We're working on some stuff. I will tell you that. We're working on some stuff. I think we may have a place to go. But again, we're working it. We're working on trying to get a good deal. That's cool. We should do that, right? But let me, I'm going to tell you something. And this is it. I'm done. This week, Two people in this church, Eric Anthony and Siandra. Eric Anthony on the phone and Siandra online on Facebook. And he said this, on two separate situations though. Eric said, I don't know what's happening, but there's something in my world, I can't tell you what it is yet, but it just came to me out of the blue. I'll let you know what it is soon. <coughs> And then Siandra was on Facebook, and she, I don't know if you guys saw the post, but she said, things were bad, things were bad, things were bad, things were bad, but out of the blue, God provided. I'm looking for out of the blue. This is what we need to pray for. And so that's the last thing I want to pray for you, with you tonight, is to ask God, look, we're working on a great deal. We're working on a great deal because we want to be good stewards of the money. And we want to have a nice place where we can hang out and have a good time and have church together and all that stuff. That's good. But let, can't we just pray that God would do something out of the blue that would just knock our socks off? Something so crazy that there's no way to say, you know what, Dan just, or Cal, or Rose, they, they worked it, man. They got a good rate at the bank and USB. That's where our bank had it, so they gave us a good deal because they're so nice, and I think Christians own it. That's all great out of the blue. Something crazy. Something crazy. I don't even want to say what it is because I don't want to ruin anything because I don't know. It seems like when you come up with an idea, God's like, well, I'm not going to do that one then. I'm going to do something else. Right? So I don't want to talk about anything awesome. Just, 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 just. You know what I mean? Let's pray. And I think we got, I don't even know if we got communion. We'll take communion together. Right, who knows? It doesn't even matter anymore. Look, all of us are family here now, so we don't have to impress anybody, right? Who cares? They might sing a song, they might not. It doesn't even matter. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. If they think about coming, this will ruin it. Hi. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, well, let's pray. Hurry up, let's pray. Father, we um, we thank you for letting us gather tonight. I, I don't even know. If, it's probably been the longest night we've ever had, but it's, it's a good night. And it seemed like everybody was really listening to your voice. And I thank you for your scripture. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, Lord, for really, I, I, I almost feel guilty just kind of saying it so quickly, but I do thank you. I know all of us do. We thank you for where you've taken us. Um, I thank you for letting us get kicked out of that church because you were in control of that. I thank you for letting us be over at the Methodist church. You were in control of that. I thank you for bringing us here to this place because you were in control of that. None of those things we could have done on our own. We have no resources whatsoever of this world, no money, no people, no denomination, no nothing. But yet here we are, your people, just seeking the authentic. We want to know that you're here with us. We want to love you better. We want to love each other better. We want to love the stranger better. We just want to continue to do the things that you've allowed us to do, helping people out with their bills and their medical stuff, and whatever it is, Lord. We are just so open to it. We just want to be the real church of Jesus Christ. We don't want anybody or any other model to tell us what to do. We just want to move and breathe and exist in you. That's all we want. So, Lord, we thank you for where you've taken us. We thank you for where we are right now, and we thank you for where we will be in the future. But our, our last thing that we want to ask you, Lord, we want, we want you to do something that is undeniably you. Like, we all just want to say, wow. We want to cry. We want to cry because you're going to do something that is out of this world, out of the blue. Out of the blue, Lord. That's what we want. We, we don't want a good deal. We want a God deal. That's what we want. Lord. We want to see you do something crazy so we can tell everybody about it here. We can tell our friends. We can go on Facebook. We can go on our website. We can do whatever we want. Our little mobile apps and all that stuff that we got. We want to use all those things to tell the world about this thing that we couldn't do and you did because you are awesome. That's what we want. So do something crazy good for your people. For your fame, for your name, for your glory. Lord, if there's any pride in any of us, knock it dead, myself included. I, I remember, Lord, when you gave me the opportunity to go to the community chapel, and I had these feelings that crept in that, oh, finally I get to be the pastor of a real church with a real building, and I was, I was prideful. 